Welcome back to the IES webinar, National Quality Mark Scheme Explained, which will be presented by Seamus Lefroy Brooks. Seamus is a multi chartered as civil engineer, geologist, and environmentalist, and he's a UK registered ground engineering advisor. He has also worked as a consultant for almost 40 years, and he is a past chair of both the AGS, which is the Association of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Specialists, and the Land Forum. Uh, he was also a founding com committee member of the Society of Brownfield Risk Assessment, and he's a chair of the National Brownfield Forum's Professional Standards Committee, leading the initiative to deliver the National Quality Mark Scheme for land affected by contamination. Today, Seamus will tell us more about the National Quality Mark Scheme for Land Contamination Management which is a scheme that has been developed by the National Brownfield Forum to provide visible identification of documents that have been checked by a suitably qualified and experienced person. So, thank you very much for logging in. Uh, Shimon, over to you. Thank you, Eduardo. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, just uh, shout if you can't. <laughs> Um, right, so uh, if you've heard this uh, presentation before, forgive me, but it's uh, I think it'll be useful for people who, who haven't heard it to bring them up to speed with uh, what's been going on with the National Quality Mark Scheme. Um, as Eduardo uh, says, it's run by the National Brownfield Forum, or the, um, that, that's uh, shown in the logo at the bottom there, and you can see the logo carried across to the Quality Mark Scheme, so it belongs as a scheme to the, to the uh, National Brownfield Forum. Um, the objectives of uh, this webinar is to uh, firstly explain why the scheme is important, uh, secondly to go through the background of uh, how it came about, uh, how it works and uh, the details of this uh, role, the SQP, that quite a few people will be aware of uh, and the responsibilities of, of an SQP. Uh, and finally, uh, to, to uh, look at how the scheme might be expanded in the future to cover other areas. Um, when I say other areas at the moment, it, it applies to, uh, to, to, to planning and that's where it's been mostly used. Right, why is it important to us? Um, in uh, November 2017, uh, we had uh, brilliant uh, support from the Environment Agency who issued a policy statement uh, saying a number of things, but most of all, um, saying that, that they would take account, they recognised the NQMS as a um, as a scheme that would uh, be helpful and, and be used. Um, they would take it into account when formulating responses under the planning system, and they would encourage developers to use it. Um, they would encourage local planning authorities to consider referencing the NQMS in standing advice. They would be able to recommend the discharge of planning conditions more quickly, reducing time and cost. They would encourage work under Part 2A voluntarily in line with the NQMS. The EA would work with its suppliers to ensure that all the work carried out for them would be subject to the NQMS. They would encourage operators to carry out any work under the NQMS in the environmental protection regulations and free app discussions. Uh, they would encourage operators to employ specialists working under the NQMS to gather, interpret and present monitoring data. And they would encourage the use of NQMS to assist and manage pollution incidents, accidents or spills, or returning a site to baseline conditions. Two more. Perhaps most importantly, they, uh, the, well, the last one is the most important in my view, but the, number nine is they would specify the need for work to be carried out under the NQMS when undertaking its enforcement activities. And lastly, where NQMS submissions conclude that pollution is being prevented or is being managed satisfactorily, the EA will take the view that no further regulatory intervention or enforcement is necessary. That, that, that's the weighty bit. It, it's a quality mark scheme, it's a voluntary scheme, and, and the intention is to uh, help people see the, uh, the, the wood for the trees. It, the, the, the issue of, um, of, of reading technical reports has long been an issue, has long been a problem, uh, and for clients and regulators, 
to be able to uh, sort out um, which bits of sometimes very impressive reports are actually worthy and useful and which bits are, uh, are or, or which reports are perhaps uh, bear less scrutiny. So the, the, there is a difficulty for people who aren't involved in the writing or, or the reviewing of um, reports to do with the management of land contamination that it all appears sort of quite technical and, and, and difficult to follow. Um, and it is, it, it is for people who haven't been involved in it. it it's quite difficult to get to your head around the various definitions of, of contamination and contaminated land and the various, um, the various re uh, regulatory um, schemes that are at work. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a fog to a, um, a developer or, or to someone who's, as I say, doesn't have that specialist knowledge. So to, to, to someone without that specialist knowledge, it can be difficult for um, them to recognize what is a good report that has been carried out to the, the right uh, technical principles or the right technical standards and the right, and has taken account of the right regulatory principles or regu policy principles or the right regulatory standards. So there's, there, there has been and there has been historically a problem in, uh, in, in sorting out the good from the bad. Um, uh, and so the National Quality Scheme is, is intended simply to uh, address that, um, that area. And as we go through, you'll see that we, when we started off, we were looking very much at a, um, looking at the product, looking at the report is either fit for purpose or it is not fit for purpose. The assessment, whatever it might be, is fit for purpose, it isn't fit for purpose. It wasn't about uh, looking at the people who'd written the report. It wasn't looking at the firms who'd written, who'd produced the work. It was looking at the report, this, the product, if you like, saying, this report does or doesn't meet um, uh, the criteria that, that would enable it to bear, if you like, a kite mark, a national quality mark scheme uh, stamp. Uh, and um, that's interesting because uh, in most cases, uh, the, the, the days uh, are perhaps gone where one person knows everything about everything that you need to know when you're dealing with the ground. Uh, and there are more commonly a number of people involved in the production of any one assessment or report uh, and so uh, there may be a team of people there may be uh, different companies involved in producing the report but what matters is that the report the assessment should be complete and should be um sh should be to the right standard so uh that's that's what's behind all this uh having said that um it is inevitable and you'll see when we move on that that uh, that it's about individuals um but however uh, importantly now, last year, that's the first part of why you should pay attention to the NQMS, is that in 2017 we had all these good words from the Environment Agency. Um, secondly, last year on the .gov website, Land Contamination Policy, um, they, uh, they upgraded that. So it now says, Land Contamination under Risk Management, it says the reports you produce um, and the information that they can include that must be produced by suitably qualified professionals. Well, that's been a, a, a statement that something similar to that stands within the national planning and policy framework. And it's a, it's a matter for some discussion as to who is suitably qualified and experienced and, and, uh, uh, and who is not, who is competent and who is not. Uh, and, and really all of that discussion is a bit difficult to have um, but it's a lot easier to look at a document and criticize a document saying this document is wrong because of this, this and this. And it, I don't, we don't really mind too much who prepared it in that sense, if it's correct. Now, you can see the next question is, well, who is going to be able to say whether it's correct or not? Uh, and that's where the SQP comes in. You, you have to have somebody, not necessarily writing it, but you have to have somebody who has the right competence to be able to look at it and say, yes, that's a good report. Um, so that's where we're trying to get to. Uh, if I move on to the next slide, I think. Have got it? Yes, that's good. Get my slide going here. Um, so under land contamination risk management, the, the .gov website makes clear that, as we would expect, you have to record and report decisions made. You have to keep factual and interpretive information separate. You can produce a single report for each stage of the risk assessment, uh, but 
uh, you should follow the requirements of this guide. Um, that, that's fairly uh, uh, specific. And it talks a bit about phasing uh, more complex sites. Um, try this one. Good. Uh, and now, the next page, it, it says uh, when reporting your findings and decisions, you can use the NQMS. And it acknowledges that this is a voluntary scheme set out by the National Brantford Forum. It says you can use the NQMS for any type of land contamination report. So a registered, suitably qualified and experienced person will check your land contamination reports. Um, they may have written the report or they may have checked it. Um, the point is that the right pair of eyes will have looked at the um, final document and, and would have said this does or doesn't meet its requirements. So the, there's flexibility as to, as to who is the NQMS, sorry, who is the person looking at a document, who is the SQP, um, are, are they an author or are they someone who looks at somebody else's work? that's been, been produced by somebody else. Either way, uh, if we're behaving as a professional in this industry, we would want to think that our work did come up to the required standard, individually I'm talking about, uh, and, and that's what we want to tap into. So an SQP, if he hasn't written the report, he'll verify, he'll review and verify, and provide a declaration that the report meets the required technical and regulatory standards. So, where does this all go back to? Uh, 1997 is um, a little while ago now, but uh, if you read this uh, comment that was made in CLR, CLR 12, um, you can see that we still have the same problems. It reads, the selection of consultants can be complex because there are large variations in the competency of companies offering contaminated land services, many of whom offer extensive services on the basis of only limited resources or experience. There is no single directory of specialist consultancies, nor any unified registration scheme which validates their competence. So this goes back to what I said at the start of this presentation, that the problem, or there has been this problem for people not um, not in the uh, contaminated land community to be somewhat befuddled by the array of people offering um, uh, services and, and trying to sort out who sound impressive and are impressive and who sound impressive but are perhaps not so impressive and it is, it is genuinely a problem that continues to um, cause problems to our industry so we're trying to sort it out. If you go back to um, uh, the <coughs> excuse me, the English Partnerships uh, Brownfield Conference in 2008. Uh, English Partnerships are, are, are the sort of forerunner to what we now know as Homes England, and uh, they acknowledged all these problems in the, in the industry, which is a fairly young industry and it still is. Uh, but they established that, that, that things had to change and they produced a, a good set of, of documents about the skills and the, the, the shortages uh, and, and the, uh, the way that the, the industry could look to sort of become more organised. And it established uh, three things, a, a national brownfield strategy, which was uh, about uh, reusing brownfield land, which is a fairly political football that's been kicked around for a number of years. It established a national skills framework, which identified, look, we have got these things. We need people who are able and competent to administer, to assess, and to, to regulate the, uh, the contaminated land, um, uh, call it an industry. And, and it established a national brownfield forum. Um, so if we go to the national brownfield forum, you can see here, who is the national brownfield forum? It's, it's all of these, and, and possibly actually some more that aren't on here, but practically everybody is a member of the National Brownfield Forum, one way or by some route or another. It's a, it, it's, it's a forum that uh, includes a lot of uh, 
government uh, departments. It includes um, the sort of uh, professional and institutional organizations that, that, that play a part. It includes uh, independent uh, groups, uh, voluntary groups, groups or, or, of regulators, groups of um, uh, uh, um, professional uh, 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 yeah, professionals within the uh, within the, 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 the fairly wide church. Um, you can see there the people like the NHBC um, and their Home Builders Federation. Um, but it, it, it's very inclusive. And so if you go back to February 2009, um, there was a question in the House of Lords saying, well, what is the National Brand for Field Forum about? And uh, this was the response you can see in Hansard. The forum's remit, uh, this is the National Brownfield Forum, the remit is to oversee the implementation of the National Brownfield Strategy to improve coordination on contaminated land brownfield policy between government, devolved administrations, regulators and practitioners, and to encourage the exchange of best practice and knowledge. So, so this is really confirming that it, it is the broadest church that we have in, in our community to try and get people, not bang their heads together, but get them to agree what, uh, what should be happening uh, uh, without any uh, uh, vested interest, shall we say. Um, well, uh, sorry. Okay, it was reformed in uh, 2011 as the, as, as the uh, land forum, but it's reverted back to the National Brownfield Forum in 2018. That was a political thing when there was a period when, when brownfield was a bit of a dirty word and no one could afford it apparently to do anything much about it, but it's, it's okay again to use the word Brownfield so that the forum's reverted to its original name. And, and its principles are to discuss Brownfield issues, to support the development of best practice by regulators, practitioners, and problem owners, to identify key challenges and to seek appropriate resolutions. Um, in uh, 2014, um, the way, the way so I should, Say the way that the National Brownfield Forum works is because it's such a broad church. People, members, bring to the um, to the table. It meets maybe four times a year. Uh, problems or issues from their own organisation, and says, "Look, can we do something about this?" And then the group decide whether they can. And, and in a lot of cases, it's all too political, or someone has a vested interest, and, and you can't get anyone to agree. But but the one thing that that was agreed was that we could collectively do something about raising standards. Of, of, um, of investigation and assessment and reporting that was being done. So what you've got in the NQMS is something that is, if you like, the lowest common denominator that could be agreed by all those people or all those organizations that were members of the um, uh, National Brownfield Forum. So there you go. And um, we looked at various things that could be done to raised standards and, and personally from my experiences in the site investigation industry long ago uh, it, it, it was an idea that we should do something from the bottom up that we could go along the some of you may be familiar with uh, some of the um, validation processes that local authorities have uh, um, developed for uh, validating a planning uh, submission and uh, documents that, that, that must for example uh, let me think now you could say that that uh, a, a site investigation report must include a death study. So that's a fairly easy thing to say, and it's a fairly easy thing to regulate. And you can validate a document that has got a death study attached to it, or you could say no and return a document that didn't. So the, 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 the thing that I had at the time uh, was that we could uh, progress from the bottom up by, by trying to raise standards more. But, but after a lot of discussion uh, within the land forum, <laughs> it was felt that um, the, 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 the first scheme anyway, and the NKMS is the result of those early discussions in January 2014 that started, um, it, it would be something that set, not a gold standard, but would set a clear uh, example of what is expected. Um, uh, and so it, it, it would be something that people would aspire to be um, emulating 
in their in their everyday um, work. Um, so that, that's where it came from. Uh, it's quite simple. It's not saying that, 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 that it's looking for a gold standard. It's saying the aim is to ensure that a satisfactory standard of work is undertaken. In doing so, that it would provide confidence to, regu confidence to regulators about the quality of submissions made under the planning system, the National Planning Policy Framework. And key thing, the scheme would be voluntary and the procedure would be simple. So that, that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to keep that. So th that's where we started back in 2014. The objectives were to improve the quality of reports that were being developed by the contaminated land industry to a level where developers and regulators could better rely upon the conclusions put forward without the need for further scrutiny or auditing. Um, so hence the idea of like a kite mark there. Look, this one's all right. This one's a, this one should should be good. And to provide assurance to developers who retain the legal responsibility for adequately dealing with land contamination problems and to the regulators that the risks arising from land contamination have been adequately assessed and dealt with by competent people. So it is just as you would hope to uh, to see a kite mark on, on goods that, that have been uh, made to a certain standard or, or made to an acceptable standard, one would like to see um, some sign that would differentiate a report that definitely did meet the requirements in terms of techni technical and regulatory um, conformance um, with one that, that possibly would, would bear further scrutiny or, or one that definitely didn't. <laughs> it's easy to pick out the ones that are shocking uh, if you review reports and it's easy to pick out the ones that are, that are good. But in between, there's an awful lot of stuff that could have been done better. And, and, and perhaps that's where we should be seeking to, uh, to, to improve ourselves. Right. So the way it works is that the reports, as I said earlier, they'll either be written or they'll be checked by uh, somebody to see that the work has been planned, undertaken and written up as required under the, uh, the government um, website by competent people that the underlying data has been collected in line with established good practice. We've got plenty of, of, of uh, guidance in this industry. So that, that, there's plenty of source material to, to be able to, to make sure or to, to refer to if we're not clear about what good practice is. Thirdly, the data has been processed, analyzed and interpreted in line with good practice. And there needs specific advice provided by the relevant regulatory authorities. So that, that's looking to see that the data has been collected, right? But that it's then been analyzed and looked at. Uh, it, it's one thing, and perhaps there's been an emphasis, uh, it's a bugbear of mine, forgive me, but, but there's been a, 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 an emphasis in site investigation of collecting data without really worrying too much about what it's actually been collected for. So um, the emphasis perhaps has been on, on digging an exploratory hole to a certain depth and taking a certain number of samples and testing those in a certain amount without really asking the question, why are we doing this? And, and in a lot of cases, um, it's all about the understanding and the pair of eyes that are looking at the trial pit uh, 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 or looking at the, a sample or looking at the test result. Uh, and it's, it's easy enough to sort of go through the motions of, of complying with every uh, imaginable uh, specification and still get to the end of it and not have the answer. Uh, and so uh, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that data is processed and analyzed and interpreted correctly. Let's leave it at that. The report sets out conclusions or recommendations that are substantiated by the underlying data and are based upon reasonable interpretations. So we're looking to see that the um, conclusions and recommendations of the report are reasonable. And finally, and this is really important actually, is, is that any limitations or in the data or uncertainties in the analysis are clearly identified. If you've been involved with that investigation, you will know that you don't ever come to a situation where you've done it, you've finished, it's great. We've got everything we need to know. There are always, we found this, but that means such and such, or, or that we found this, we could therefore 
go and look for I'm not saying we should necessarily go back and, and look for some more information about a particular area or a particular aspect of the site, but it's very unlikely that any site investigation report or assessment of, of results that it's perfect. And we're not expecting perfection. We just need to know that a good report acknowledges the fact that it has raised certain, maybe it's raised certain uncertainties. In other cases, it might have um, reduced the uncertainty uh, and information gap to a certain level, but not completely. And, and a good report will process the data, will analyze it, and then say, Yo, this is where we've moved on. This, this assessment, this information, this report has moved us from this position to this position. We now know this. And then it, it's good enough to acknowledge it, but we don't know this. And, and here's a few things that, that we should worry about, and these are things that we shouldn't worry about. So that, that's quite important, that last um, last point there. NQMS benefits, well, uh, this is the marketing bit. If, if the scheme can deliver products where the land contamination work is done right first time, the clients and developers will incur less costs. Planning applications will be subject to less delay. Regulators will spend less time in the detailed reviewing of outputs and can better focus their resources on high risk or poor quality submissions. So the idea here was that uh, if you're a regulator and you've got a pile of reports or applications to look at, you might enjoy or you might have higher expectations of um, the ones that, that bore a quality mark as opposed to the ones that didn't. It, it, it's a bit of reassurance. Uh, and uh, if, you're, um, if, you, if your resources, as we all know, resources have been drained in, 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 the, public, um, in, in the public sector, uh, and uh, this scheme, from that point of view, does help um, people prioritise their resources. Regulators might prioritise their resources on the basis of, of, of dividing the world into uh, documents that bear the national quality mark and those that don't. Um, SQP role. So the SQP has to be that person who has the ability to, uh, to look at something and say whether it does actually meet the requirements or not. They're an individual, in practice, they're an individual who's approved and registered by the scheme, who checks the report, and whose judgment can be relied upon with some degree of finality. It, it's really important that they should know what they're talking about. They should be aware of, of whether they've got a report that's right or, or whether it is failing in some way, uh, and they are able to, uh, to, to make a judgment about it. They will ensure that the key aspects of the report have either been checked directly by themselves or by individuals with a requisite level of capability. Go back to what I said earlier, we don't expect one person to know everything about everything. So uh, SQP may well need to turn to another organization or another recognized professional to, uh, to be able to satisfy themselves that, they, um, that, that, that the, 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 the assessment or report is correct. And, and we'll come on later to um, a, a parallel scheme that's been developed by the so by sober the society of biofield risk assessment where um you can look at dqras and the people doing dqras and whether to believe it. again they can be very impressive figures and assessments produced in all sorts of testing and and, and, and analysis but fundamentally if the person uh working the machine isn't good enough to make the assessment it, 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 it's quite possible that an assessment may slip through without it being correct so SOBRA have developed a scheme for, for brownfield risk assessments to be uh, certificated and, and, and to be um, uh, recognized for their skills and competence and experience. And, and so there is a way of recognizing that, that people have a particular um, skill. And, and so you can delegate some of this um, recognition of skills by checking that, that there is a quality, some sort of quality assurance going on. Uh, importantly, the last bit, uh, the SQP signs a declaration, but then a separate declaration required for each document. So it's worth going back. It's each document that we're focusing on, not the, not 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 a submission or not not any sort of bigger thing than a one identifiable document. So, um, who is eligible to be an SQP? Uh, a lot of discussion about whether they could be anybody. Uh, uh, and in the end, because we're talking about individuals, we said that the person has to have uh, a, a sense of responsibility and they have to have 
something that could be um, taken away from them uh, in the case of a sanction if they did something that, that was or did something that, that, that was negligent and in those cases uh, it, it, with, we, with that thought in mind it was decided that we would have chartership um, and, and only look at people who have achieved chartership and are bound by a professional code of conduct um, that we could then use them and the threat of of, of them losing that chartership for, for acting unprofessionally um, that that would produce the sort of integrity that we are looking for for, for that um, individual so hence that's why the chartered professional bit comes in uh, we're looking for sufficient specialism of contaminated land experience to have a good overview of both the, the, the regimes and, and what is required to assess a site Quite often, it's a case of knowing what's missing as opposed to what's presented. So it, it is a bit difficult here, but you do need somebody who can look and say, there's something missing here. Uh, uh, and that is, is very difficult to get from a textbook. That's something that comes from experience of similar situations. Uh, uh, that, for example, um, looking at, 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 at gas works with certain elements of, of, of um, contamination that one's looking for. Uh, and until you found them all, or in your mind, um, closed off uh, where certain things were done, or where the waste were put, or, 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 or how things were done, um, you'll be looking for them. Uh, and so it may be that you're, you, you go to a site and you find certain results from a certain investigation, but until you have <laughs> until you've looked for the tar pit, for example, you, you will possibly not have got to the bottom of a of a of a, of a, um, a gas work site. Um, moving on, the the actual. Um, I'm just going to go back slightly. Uh, yeah, let's keep it eligibility. So um, you need to be somebody who has a, a, a thorough knowledge, demonstrable understanding of the issues, and can demonstrate that uh, you have the right experience. The actual operation of the NQMS is run by the National Brownfield Forum. There's an NQMS steering group and uh, it's administered by Claire, you may be familiar with as an organization. And the SQPs, because they have to be registered and they have to be assessed, uh, they're being provided by SILK, uh, the, the, the specialist in land condition uh, registry. Uh, that being at present, it doesn't mean that, that Silk will always or be will, will only ever be the uh, the uh, provider of SQPs, but but they have a jolly good scheme in place, and uh, um, uh, and they uh, uh, are producing more at the moment. So at the moment, you have to become a Silk to become a uh, an SQP. Now um, I won't go through too much detail of the declaration process. It's automated. It costs seventy five pounds per document. Uh, and there's an online scheme that, that goes through how it's all given a separate number. Each document is given a separate number. Uh, uh, the um, steering group, the NQMS is now run by a subgroup of the Nat Land Forum, uh, of the National Brownfield Forum, uh, which is made up of local authority regulators, industry groups, and, and other regulators. And they meet or, or, or discuss things uh, two or three times a year. Um, how many, uh, how much growth have we had? It's been going since 2017, so three years. We've got 115 registered at seem to be qualified and experienced professionals. There have been nearly 100 um, uh, declarations submitted. What does that look like? Uh, actually, a bit of an increase recently, um, but uh, it's a steady growth. Uh, and, and we expect it to be a slow burn for the first five years, to be honest, uh, as it becomes more and more um, taken up by local authorities uh, and put, as, as was said earlier, as put into their guidance and, and taken account of. So at the moment, if we look where we are, these are the local authorities that have taken it on board so far uh, and are referring to the NQMS and their policies. Uh, and there's a, you can see there's a long way to go. There's no denying that, but, but it's a jolly good start. <laughs> um, timeline, I'm going to rattle through these because I want to leave some time for questions. 2014, as I said, we looked at how could we improve standards um, and uh, we started to draft it out. 2015, there was some 
further reviews, 2016, further reviews. It launched in 2017, uh, and we had that uh, signpost by uh, um, .gov.uk in June 18, although it was a year later before it got put onto the website. Um, meanwhile, we just missed it, the uh, environment actually had, had uh, signposted it. Um, we did an updated bit of guidance in May, I, I, well, nearly a year ago, um, which just repeats what I've said in a, in a sense. So this is end by looking at this. It's a voluntary scheme to ensure that any type of land contamination documents meet the necessary technical and regulatory standards before they're submitted. The scheme helps reduce the commercial stress caused by avoidable regulatory delay associated with the submission of incomplete or unsatisfactory reports. And the NQMS seeks to provide an assurance that the submission will get it right the first time for the regulator with the obvious economic benefits of so doing. So um, I think my final slide is this, just looking where we are. So we have 15 local, now 33 local authorities referring to the land, the NQMS and the land contamination guys. Oh, well, that, that, that was it a, a year ago. It, it's, it's a bit more than that now. Uh, and there's, there's 100 SQPs registered there about. So um, that's it. Thank you very much indeed for listening, if you have been. <laughs> and uh, have we got any questions? Thank you very much, James. And uh, yeah, really great presentation. You really outlined very well all the benefits of this scheme. Uh, so yeah, now we are taking questions. So there, sh there should be some coming up soon. Do we see any evidence that NQMS report receive less scrutiny or auditing? I, I, I wish we could, and the moment we do, we'll be shouting about it. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're well aware of the audit and the feedback systems, because there are um, there are feedback systems, there are auditing procedures in place, not only from the Environment Agency, but from Clare and from local authorities themselves. And, and all of that is just in the course of happening at the moment. And I hope this year brings us some, you know, it'd be great to have some, 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 something positive to say that, that yes. I, I think one thing where I've seen it working already is, is where um, uh, local authorities and the environment agency are only able to respond in a certain time frame because of the systems and the, the resources that, that, that are out there. And in those cases, a, uh, a developer who might be moving ahead with big financial decisions might look for some sort of insurance, should we call it that? That, that, that everything's going in the right way, that the remediation scheme that is costed and, 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 and is planning to do will be the right one. So if he wants to give a little bit of comfort there, he might say, yes, I'll go for the NQMS just to, to, um, to, to show or to have the comfort that, that the thing has been looked at, definitely looked at by somebody who, who knows what they're looking at. Thank you very much. And yes, Rihanna asks, um, outside of financial barriers, what are the main reasons why local authorities are not taking up the scheme? <laughs> I think they don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and I, I think that's, that's the main issue. Uh, and uh, the, there is this extraordinary disjunct between planning departments uh, and uh, the people who do know about the scheme and, and would, would um, support it are the environmental health departments and the, the contaminated land officers. Uh, I don't think they would say it was a bad scheme. I think they'd, they'd support it, by and large they do. The, the, the problem comes that the, the, the planning departments are sort of separated. Uh, and, and for those authorities that have, uh, the, the, I'm thinking of Leeds here, that, that, that have the, um, the contaminated land people almost embedded in the planning department, things work a, a, a lot better, I think, anyway. But the, the problem is the people perhaps do not understand the benefits of the scheme there. It's come back to marketing. Hey, thank, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we run out of time, but thank you very much for answering all these questions. And uh, uh, so I would like to take uh, this time also to thank you, like all the attendees, and, and uh, invite you to uh, record your attendance in the IES CPD tool. So don't forget to do this. And so this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the IES website and the IES YouTube channel. Um, so we do invite you to follow this channel by subscribing and so that you will also be notified every time that a new webinar is added.
I would also like to invite the attendees to register for our next webinar, which is uh, Seeking Sustainability for Coffee Farmers and Consumers, uh, which will be, pre will be represented by Jeremy Hager on the 26th of February. And you can also register for this webinar and other forthcoming webinars on the uh, IES uh, events page. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you also, Seamus. Okay, thanks, Eduardo.